So, uh, Commissioner Savinicki asked that I warm you up with, with a joke uh, so that she, she doesn't have the pressure of having to come up with a joke. So, a photon checks into a hotel and the bellhop says, do you need some help with your luggage? And the photon says, no thanks, I travel light. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll work on these for next year. So, let me introduce Commissioner Savinicki. Commissioner Christine Savinicki was sworn in for a second term as a commissioner of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission on June 29, 2012. Her first term began in March of 2008. She came to the commission from a position on the staff of the Senate Armed Services Committee where she worked on issues such as nuclear defense programs, nuclear security, and environmental management. Prior to her work in the Senate, Commissioner Savinicki worked as a nuclear engineer in various positions with the U.S. Department of Energy, both in Washington, D.C. and in Idaho. Before that, she was an energy engineer for the Wisconsin Public Service Commission. And on a personal note, um, in my 30 years or so as a, a member of the U.S. NRC, you kind of form you know, some favorites among commissioners. I have to say Commissioner Savinicki is one of my favorites because of her, her intelligence, her, her focus on providing what I believe to be very uh, excellent vote sheets and, and well-written, and not the least of which is uh, a dry wit that I come to appreciate greatly. So I give you Commissioner Christine Savinicki. Well, good morning. Thank you, Bill, for that uh, introduction, and I very much appreciate your uh, kind words. I think when I began my service as a commissioner, it was uh, my hope that I would earn the respect of the agency's hardworking staff, or at least some of them, so that's very meaningful to me. Thank you. Um, I'm very pleased to take part in this year's regulatory information con conference. It is the first intergalactic regulatory information conference, as is evidenced by the um, model of the Death Star that appears in the middle of the stage there. I think that the people working on the artwork saw, they saw Star Wars for sure, I think. Um, but my hat's off to their creativity. I'm not the least bit uh, creative artistically or visually, so I do appreciate uh, the hard work on, on the artwork. Uh, and, and I do want to add my thanks to the many NRC employees who make the conference possible. I know we all say this, uh, but we need to say it because of the fact that we would not have the successful conference every year if it weren't for our many conference staff and volunteers. Uh, so I do thank them, and many of them uh, do it and do it again each year, so that's great. Uh, I would like also to acknowledge our many colleagues in attendance who've joined us from across the country and around the world, and, and I thank you for taking your very precious time and traveling here to be with us or even tuning in to the webcast because uh, there are many things uh, competing for your attention, I'm sure, so I appreciate your time. And to any of those uh, that I've met this year or spoken to or visited your facilities, I do appreciate you uh, adding to my journey of continuous learning, which is what it is or has been for me to be an NRC commissioner. It's been a journey of continual uh, learning, and, and I do thank you for sharing your wisdom and insights and experiences with me. Uh, I also would like to acknowledge the president, presence of other important partners from federal, state agencies. I don't know if we have any local officials here today. But the NRC's many critical relationships with other governmental entities are essential uh, to the achievement of our mission. So I thank you for taking the time to be here, and in some cases, for agreeing to be panelists in some of our breakout sessions. Thank you for that. Uh, good morning to my commission colleagues. Chairman Burns, thank you for your willingness to return to the NRC for a term of service on the commission and subsequently to serve as its chairman. I'm very grateful for your willingness to do that. Commissioner Barron, thank you for your willingness to come at all of these issues with a fresh perspective and to challenge us to consider things from different vantage points. I really value your many contributions to the commission and your service here. And Commissioner Ostendorf, I didn't I'll just jump over you arbitrarily, as has been mentioned, after completing your current term of service in June. You have elected to turn your attention to the important work of shaping young minds 
and to invest your energy in the development of the policy leaders of tomorrow. Those are the women and men who will, at uh, some day, at forums just like this one, take your place and take my place. And uh, I think we all uh, share a debt of gratitude to you for your willingness to do that work. It has been a pleasure and certainly an honor to serve alongside you first as congressional staff colleagues and then here on the Nuclear Regulatory Commissions. And we have traveled an interesting road, my friend, have we not? We, we certainly have. And, you know, I, I just want to say there's been reference to the fact of, of differing views and differing opinions. But in those rare instances where Commissioner Ostendorf and I did, did not or could not for whatever reason see eye to eye in an issue, I always knew that your position was rooted in principle. It was advanced with a lot of honesty, sometimes very raw honesty, and it was defended always without any malice or guile. And I think it is possible, doesn't seem very evident, but it is possible to have those kinds of very civil and respectful differences of opinion. I would like to think, I haven't served on other commissions, but I would like to think that our commission tries to model that behavior always. We try to model it for our staff, as they might have differences of opinion uh, for, with each other, but I think we try to model it more broadly, that it is possible, and I felt really good. I thought we got some acknowledgement in our two most recent congressional hearings, uh, comments from the dais, from congressmen and senators, uh, that they, they could observe that it was apparent uh, how well we worked together. So I, I think we should take some pride in that. I think it's, it's an accomplishment. And um, it's pronounced fuchsia, and it's not fuchsia, which is always what you want to call it, or it's pronounced pink, anything, any color you'd like to call it. But it, it is technically fuchsia. I know I expanded your view of what colors can be made in a, different types of apparel. I just think you're jealous because as I look out, I notice that all the gentlemen really have our, their wardrobe is confined somewhat narrowly to parts of the color palette, and women uh, can wear anything they want almost pretty much. Well, if they're, if they're Lady Gaga or somebody, they can wear whatever they want. But, you know, I also would note, I wanted to wear, and as I was trying to leave the house today, I felt that I should go put on a black outfit. I, in all seriousness, I was very tempted to do that. But then uh, I was remembering that today is International Women's Day, so I want to welcome all of the women here today. Today is International Women's Day. And um, I thought... You know, I didn't want to wear a bright color because it seemed not serious to me. And then I have these long internal monologues with myself. And I said, really, Christine, on International Women's Day, you don't want to wear it because it's feminine, because being feminine is not serious. So I really, you know, I really challenged myself on this stuff. I'm like, no, there's nothing that makes it not seriousness. That's somebody, it's not, not serious. That's just somebody uh, else's opinion about it. And so, um, although I think in the United States for our international visitors, I don't know that we make as much of International Women's Day as a number of other countries do, but um, First Lady Michelle Obama will be meeting with um, girls in schools today because the theme, at least in the U.S. this year, is let her learn about the education of girls and women, uh, which I think is a very important topic to be talking about. So uh, this is my eighth Rick speech, not that I'm counting or anything. And in a few short weeks, I'll begin my ninth year of service on this commission. That brings to mind for me, I wasn't going to mention this is a little off color, but I was listening to a, um, a female comedian and she goes, you hear about women being in labor for 20 hours. I don't even want to do something pleasurable for 20 hours. It's like way too long to be doing something. But um, eight years is a long time to be doing something. And um, you tend to fall into patterns. One unfortunate pattern is, as I mentioned last year, I told a joke at my first RIC, and then people have this expectation that you'll tell another joke. Now, as I sat here this morning, I thought, perhaps uh, Mr. Dean is well and truly taking that responsibility off my shoulders. I don't have any better jokes than him. I had to decide. Um, puns are the lowest form of humor. Am I the only one who calls them that? So I had a pun. And I'm a vegetarian, so it was funny to me. The other one is based on such tired, sexist stereotypes that I wasn't going to tell it. And then I thought, wait, it's International Women's Day. So I ought to tell that one, because women come off looking kind of good in it. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. Between the, should I tell neither? What should I do? 
Go for it. Okay, so both. Well, I think I heard a clear vote for both. Um, so the first one is, have you heard that there's new scientific evidence that vegetables can feel pain as you're eating them? That's why I drowned all mine in dressing. It's the only romaine thing to do. Okay, and the other one, since that one went over so well. I got a little bit more out of them than you have done. You're a commissioner. Okay. Oh, that's right. He said, I'm a commissioner, so you have to laugh. Um, so a, a computer company distributed a corporate clothing catalog, you know, like logoed catalog for the employees. It included a pair of cufflinks that had the two keys from the computer keyboard for control and escape. A female employee was overheard saying to another, it'd make a great gift for any man because it would remind him of the two things he can never have. <laughs> So let me. That was funny. That was a good one. See, I thought it's funny the men liked it because you're all a really good spirited group. But I don't know the women if the women liked it. But anyway, um, maybe we liked it for different reasons. Um, I should try to get through some remarks, I guess, here. Uh, and then if we wanted to leave time for Commissioner Ostendorf, I did talk to Bill about ending early, um, partly because Commissioner Ostendorf's Q&A has the potential to be the most interesting thing in the RIC. Have you noticed how when people are leaving, they become, like, really honest about things? So um, his Q&A might really be good. Uh, but the best analogy I could use, I am beginning to feel, the longer I'm at NRC, that, that I draw these uh, comparisons to a family. It does feel like being in a family. There's a musician and spoken word poet, Loudon Wainwright, and I'm a fan of his works, but he, uh, was, he has this way that he put it. He said, I doubt that the length of the acquaintance necessarily makes it easier for loved ones to know you better or for you to know them the past keeps getting in the way. And I think that is true in families, a little bit uh, true in NRC. And as a, as a commissioner, I communicate on the issues that come before me principally through the vehicle of my written votes or in the case of our adjudicatory orders through a dissent or additional views that I might append to that decision. And in the course of the last year since I spoke here, those views in various forms have run the gambit from uh, very sincere expressions of commendation uh, from me to the NRC staff for those instances where I feel that their work was very insightful and I uh, feel very blessed by the careful uh, and disciplined work that they do, to those instances where I have called out things when I'm not convinced, when I think that maybe it isn't going to work the way people think. and. Uh, uh, so, I, you know, it, it runs the gambit, and that's why Bill's expression of, of at least acknowledging my hard work is so meaningful to me, because that's what I'm there to do as a commissioner. I, I kind of say I'm the internal skeptic. I'm the asker of tough questions, and I just had the opportunity to meet the newest member of the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board, and he was saying, well, I ask a lot of questions. Some of them are dumb. I don't like that phrase, dumb questions. But he said, you know, that out of, I asked 10 questions. That 10th one sometimes really gets to something that we all need to talk about, and I think that that's true. In his Washington Post review of the book, Dissent and the Supreme Court, book reviewer David Cole writes, majority opinions are exercises in power. Dissents are appeals to our better judgment. The majority prevails, but the dissenter's role is by far the more romantic. It is the work of the individual who, on principle, stands against the crowd. History, not rhetoric or cogency, determines whether a dissent wins out in the long run. Yet, by articulating a compelling vis vision, a persuasive dissent can contribute to the arc of historical change. My recent vote on the establishment of centers of expertise comes to mind in this regard, although I wouldn't call the vote romantic. I'll have to think more about that. Um, I knew I wasn't going to be on the winning side of the question when I cast the vote, so I was able to, shall we call it, give full license to my uh, misgivings about the proposal. Now, anyone who's in, in NRC who's a student of my positions, and I certainly hope you have better things to do with your free time, but um, you know that I am a near universal skeptic of the establishment of task forces, steering committees, groups, 
centers, directorates, or any of the other broad panoply of bureaucratic workarounds for what I think is often some sort of process or organizational dysfunction, and I think that you ought to get, we have a little thing in nuclear called a root cause, so I'm big on those. Um, but in this specific case, I even attached a memorandum to that vote, was an internal NRC memo from 1979 uh, where an individual spoke uh, very freely, an NRC uh, individual spoke very freely about how such a proposal had been tried and had failed in his view as fundamentally unworkable. Now only time will tell if, as David Cole said about dissents, uh, whether or not my vote will contribute to the arc of historical change, but over enough time, maybe, who knows, in some cases, playing the role of internal skeptic is no more complicated than attempting to hold the agency's work product to the same high levels of scrutiny as it will be held to after it is finalized, but doing so before that work product leaves the building as final regulatory action. In the case of rulemaking, the standards as laid out in the Administrative Procedure Act of 1946 are straightforward. Under that law, the reviewing courts are instructed to hold unlawful and set aside agency action findings and conclusions that are found to be, one, arbitrary, capricious, and abu abuse of discretion or otherwise not in accordance with the law, two, contrary to constitutional right, power, privilege, or immunity, three, in excess of statutory jurisdiction, authority, or limitations, or short of statutory right, or four, without observance of the procedure required by law. Now this seems straightforward enough, doesn't it? Until you throw into the mix court deference to agency expertise, factual expertise, as well as deference to the agency's own interpretation of its powers under the relevant statute. As long as the right procedural steps are followed, the odds seem pretty much stacked in the regulator's favor. Still, that makes the role of the internal skeptic that much more necessary and important. There's nothing to stop the NRC from requiring the most exacting standards of itself, and careful study of the agency's regulatory history would bear out that traditionally the NRC has held it to higher standards, I think, than any of its critics have held it. So what exactly is the reward for fulfilling the role of internal skeptic? Well, I would say it provides its own satisfaction. As better articulated in the words of Abraham Lincoln, let us have faith that right makes might, and in that faith, let us, to the end, dare to do our duty as we understand it. Or, considering this is a very diverse crowd, if you prefer your wisdom in the form of a country music lyric, Stand your ground when everybody's given in. And lo and behold, when you stand that ground long enough, you might find that you convince people of something now and then. You might even convince a group of people to change their mind about something. And those moments, I will tell you, are the particularly gratifying ones. Those are the moments that keep you in it for the long haul. And if your tenure is long enough, you might also develop a deeper understanding of where and how things change and where they don't or where they are not likely to. It recently occurred to me, I don't know what I was thinking of at the time, but I did some quick uh, calculation in my head and it occurred to me that if an NRC employee has in the neighborhood of 25 years that they've spent with NRC as an agency employee, I have been a commissioner on their commission for about one-third of their career. And uh, that's something I tend to call scary math, meaning it's math that you do and you kind of go, that's kind of scary that to, think, to think of that, so I try not to think about it. But what insights have I developed in that time period? By my observation, it's people that change the most readily, partly because people are more resilient often than we give them credit for, but partly also in an organization people will move in and out and through various positions of responsibility in the organization. So to my observation, that's the most ready type of change that you see. Processes are the thing that change the next most readily in my observation, and least changeable of all is culture. 
Now, I'm certainly not suggesting that it's impossible to change an organization's culture. And I would even posit to you that there are some good things about culture not being readily changeable. Almost every organization has positive attributes to their culture, and you want those to be deep-rooted. But you've heard this morning, and you will hear more throughout this conference, about NRC's Project AIM initiative. In a session this afternoon, I think we've heard tell of this, the nuclear industry, nuclear industry presenters will um, discuss the in initiatives they have going on industry-wide to respond to changes in the broader energy economy, but in, within their industry as well. If we step back, though, I think in any given period, it's tempting to claim that we are faced with uniquely dynamic levels of change, levels of change that our predecessors didn't have to confront. I personally think that that distorts reality a bit. I, I inst instead look at it as an enduring uh, change imperative that's going on all the time for people and organizations. I think it's the concept of remaining static. That's an illusion, as we're sometimes reminded, even if you think you're standing still. The earth is moving, so you're actually in, in, in movement yourself. So I think our commitment to, to ongoing change, or a better word would be a commitment to ongoing adaptation as people and as organizations, uh, that commitment needs to be deep and enduring in my mind. And I appreciate that Victor McCree made some reference to this this morning. He said, long after we stop referring to Project AIM as Project AIM, and call it something else. I think what Victor was talking about was this change imperative, this adaptation imperative that we have. I think anything less than a deep commitment to that and acknowledgement of it is a disservice to those we serve and those we lead. I think that a commitment to continuous learning and change is reflected in the nuclear technology professions in NRC as an organization. It's our commitment to continuous improvement and a learning environment. In other words, sometimes you're just in it for the long haul, whether you wish it or not, whether you expect it to be or not, whether you want Project AIM to be one and done, it's going to be followed by the next necessary change and the next adaptation and the one after that and the one after that. In her article entitled The Long Haul, the journalist Amy Schoen writes, I have a confession to make. I've been reading the same book for nine years. In my defense, it's really long. I don't know if it makes it better or worse that it's an obscure book. I'm in no particular hurry to finish. For one thing, there's not much of a plot, so it's not as if I've been on the edge of my seat for a decade. And for another, reading this book has become part of who I am. In this article, she goes on to examine what she terms the mystical appeal of the long haul. Why do people stay at something for a long period of time? She concludes that the appeal lies in, quote, being and staying open to the possibilities. It lies in enjoying the slowness of a worthy, complex endeavor, in surrounding yourself with people, with positive people of a like mind, and remembering to laugh, even through the moments that aren't fun, even when you look in front of you and see hundreds more miles to walk, even when life takes over and you need to put away your project and come back to it later. These are all part of the process. They are all, in fact, what makes the long haul so very worthy. And in the end, by pushing ourselves, by digging deep, we will get a little closer to knowing what we are made of. This week we mourned the passing of a, I was going to say a large figure in American political life, very small woman, but a very significant figure in American political life. Nancy Reagan passed away a couple of days ago. Now she will be uh, in a few days laid to rest next to her husband, President Ronald Reagan, in California at the site of his presidential library. At the dedication of that presidential library in 1991, President Reagan spoke these words, the last part of which is actually engraved on his tomb, just the last part of, of the quote I'm going to give. He said, in my 80 years, I've seen what men can do for each other and to each other. I've seen war and peace, feast and famine, 
depression and prosperity, sickness and health. I've seen the depths of suffering and the peaks of triumph, and I know in my heart that man is good, that what is right will always eventually triumph, and that there is purpose and worth to each and every life. Thank you. So, Commissioner, we have a handful of, of questions. Uh, this first one, actually, I think is a pretty good one. <clears throat> Based on your experiences as a congressional staffer and a commissioner, are there any legislative innovations that the commission could recommend or pursue? For example, at a past commission hearing, David Lockbaum of the UCS suggested there be financial incentives for safety enhancements. The commission, our commission, of course, has the opportunity to propose legislative uh, changes and fixes to the Congress. Uh, I don't know that I've sat and thought hard about this uh, in recent times, but I, I, I think my reaction would be more that I marvel at the wisdom of the Atomic Energy Act. I think that in its form and as subsequently amended rather modestly over the years, I think it provided a very forward-looking and fulsome structure for the United States of America to harness the power of the atom for good and civilian and for various civilian uses. And I think within that framework, it is up to the NRC to take that legal framework and craft this body of regulation, which we've done, that I think is, is very robust. And I'm hard-pressed. There might be ways that we could uh, further improve our regulations themselves. But I don't think that I would say that I find the law itself lacking. Um, so here's a question related to uh, your expression of your role as an internal skeptic. Thanks for honoring the role of the internal skeptic. It's indeed important. How do you view the role of the external skeptic, including those who believe the NRC uh, does not uh, fully endorse adequate safety? I'm very sincere in stating that uh, I love that we get a diversity of public comment. Chairman Burns was asked a question along these lines earlier, and he said, I think it was, a, you know, how, how do you feel about getting uh, public comment that is on the maybe extremes of the continuum of perspectives that the public holds? I think that that's very valuable in reference to my statement about asking ten questions, nine of which fall pretty flat, but the tenth one is the one that everybody forgot to ask. I think that it is useful to have the far extremes of public comment. I, I spend a, a good bit of time looking at public comment records that we receive, not just the staff's uh, synthesis and response to those. Uh, I think that that's where you're going to discover things that might otherwise fall through the gaps. Now, you don't always agree with the far extremes of perspectives that are presented to you, but I think that there's, there's real value in spending some time considering those things that might seem a little bit out there but really make you step back. And I will say that as a commissioner, it's, it's a tremendous privilege, but it's an awesome responsibility, and not awesome like young people say, as in awesome as an inspiring awe, maybe a little bit scary at times, to have this kind of public responsibility to balance all of these perspectives and arrive at a decision or judgment. It's great, I think, to serve on a commission where my individual view then gets balanced against people who have very different resumes than me. And so at the end of the day, when I talk to friends and family about the safety of nuclear in the United States, it's not just my wisdom. It's that whole system of making sure that we've thought about it from every angle. And I know it seems tedious and ponderous at times, and it, it takes a lot of time to go through those procedural steps. But as a result, I think that's where you can reside all your confidence. It's not in the wisdom of any man or woman. It's this collective ability to make sure that we've looked at it hard and from every angle. So I think that the people who have views on the market, believe you me, there's days that I cast a vote on our commission that I feel maybe just as extreme as any external skeptic feels. I won't crawl under my car and check the brake lines before I drive them. No, that's a horrible thing to say. Um, 
but some days we, we kind of, you know, it's like we cast that vote and it's like the missiles are flying, hallelujah. Uh, I know that I upset people. I, I do. I, maybe. I, but it's, I have tremendous respect for the NRC staff and, and people are not shy about sharing their view with me. I know that there's a lot of concern about why did people differ from other people. Maybe it's coming from Capitol Hill. I'm not bothered by that at all. What I don't like is people not being respectful and not being civil. I'm, I wish we could all do a little bit better. It's why I closed with the, um, the remarks of Ronald Reagan because, I mean, he had a pretty rough political career. And I know that politics can be rough business, but I, I do think that it's possible to have very different views and, and come together. And I think sometimes that my strong dissents or no votes or yes votes that are maybe for something else other than what was proposed, I think that they, they play an important role and I struggle with dissents on adjudicatory orders between the view that you don't want to shine a spotlight on the fact that you're dissenting because that means that others didn't agree with you. But after the passing of Justice uh, Scalia, who I had tremendous respect for, I thought about, he was known for zingy dis dissents. Now I'm not prepared to, to, you know, be in any way mentioned in the same sentence with Justice Scalia. But, you know, he was very smart and someone I have a lot of respect for. And he didn't pull his punches. And I, so I think there's room for that as long as respect is there. Um, so the next, next question is actually in an area that, that um, you have expressed some skepticism with the staff on, on the new reactor licensing process. And the question is, what lessons has the NRC learned from initial application of Part 52? I think the concept is good, and we're, of, of, I'm sorry, <laughs> to complete my thoughts. The concept is good of segmented, um, you know, licensing for new reactors, but I do continue to believe that for large light water reactors, the strength of Part 52 uh, is in the one-step licensing. Uh, my understanding is, and I guess it's getting to be, what, 20, 25 years ago now, when people were trying to look at ways to get better stability and predictability into the reactor licensing process, uh, that was the core learning that is now reflected in Part 52. It is interesting that we're now looking at maybe stepwise or segmented licensing for different types of reactors. Now that might cause one to say, well, that invalidates the learning of Part 52, but I don't agree with that. I think you need a tailored application of process depending on what you're trying to do. I was reading some remarks of um, former Deputy Secretary Dan Poneman the other day and he had a great Nietzsche quote in there which was the most common form of human stupidity is to forget what we were trying to do in the first place. So um, that's a great quote. I couldn't fit that into my remarks but now I fit it into the Q&A. Um, but I think that you need to, to, the processes are just processes, they're tools. We shouldn't be a servant of something, it should serve us. And I think that that is something that gives me a lot of comfort about the way that the NRC applies its regulatory framework, both as it exists. I think the staff uses a lot of discernment and judgment in terms of applying the regulatory framework that's there. You mentioned the shine technology. You know, we talk about that, or people who aren't up close to it. I can't describe to you how weird the shine technology is. It was unlike really anything we do on a day-to-day -day basis and, and it does give me confidence that the NRC staff could take this regulation and that regulation and say this applies and that doesn't apply or this applies to a certain extent or um, you know how can the safety case be made here. Now we are just at the construction permit stage and we'll get when we get to an operating <coughs> license that'll, that'll tell the, the larger tale there. But um, I think that, that we do have the wisdom to go ahead and apply these processes. I do think there are things in Part 50 and 52 that just don't fit for uh, small modular reactors and advanced reactors, whatever form they might take. And I'm confident that even if we don't have a Part XX that's just for this exotic reactor, uh, we have the discernment and judgment to apply the basic safety and security fundamentals and emergency preparedness. We can do that uh, if we're allowed to exercise that judgment. And uh, I think uh, we do have a lot of critics who are uncomfortable with the use of exemptions. I, I, I don't have an issue with exemptions. If you can force people to do something, if you, if you have the power under law to compel, you have to have a commensurate power to exempt or excuse or offer relief. Those two things absolutely go hand in hand. Uh, and so 
uh, anyone granted an exemption by the NRC, I think, would testify to the rigor with which they have had to demonstrate their ability to qualify for that exemption. So I, I think that if we're allowed to use the tools we have available, I think 50, 52, or however we might approach advanced reactors, uh, the basics are there to do just fine. Um, so here's a question related to uh, storage of, of high-level waste. Will the approval of interim storage be contingent on approval of Yucca Mountain? If the question refers to the potential applications that the NRC might receive for consolidated uh, storage facilities, these are the ones that have been much talked about in the trade press. Uh, there is not any linkage. We have uh, regulations that would allow us to license uh, consolidated interim storage facilities. So uh, unless I'm missing something about the question, there isn't any legal or regulatory uh, nexus with disposal. Okay. So one, one more question and then um, sort of a coda at the end. Um, the statement of considerations for 10 CFR Part 73 refers to high assurance. Is this a term of art that means the same thing as reasonable assurance, or does it support and ensure that we can maintain reasonable assurance of adequate protection of safety? I haven't looked at 73 particularly in some years. I'd have to go back and look at the context of the reference to high assurance. Just from the English language standpoint, I don't, it sounds different, so I would need to look at the, SOC, the statement of considerations and. Um, I'd need to understand maybe a distinction was being drawn with reasonable assurance there, but that in and of itself would be odd to me, and I'd want to understand that a little bit better. There isn't anything in the Atomic Energy Act about security that calls for high assurance, so I don't know. Sometimes we just get literary, and, and that's another reason I know people, you know, my votes, I'm such a stickler for just speaking with clarity and saying what you mean. It's because 10 years from now, 20 years from now, your phraseology that you thought was a rhetorical flourish becomes a career for a lawyer and a technical person's worst nightmare. So, uh, you know, that's why if you want to, NRC has had uh, wonderful poetry slams. We actually have a spoken word poetry contest inside the building, and so people have other outlets for creative, vague terminology that they want to use, and it shouldn't be in regulations, and it shouldn't be in guidance. Yeah, as a matter of fact, one of my staff, Tanya Hood, won that competition this year. It's so. amazing. I went to one. I was out of town for the last one that was held this year. I, just NRC's creativity really, in, in, at least in spoken word poetry, really blew me away. I, it was amazing. So to NRC staff that can go to future ones, it's, it's really great. So, so the last one here is really not a question, but I think it's something that perhaps you and I have engendered, and it's a joke for the commissioner. How many nuclear engineers does it take to change a light bulb? The answer is two, one to change the light bulb and one to find a place to store the old one for 100,000 years. Hey, that's good. I yeah. like that one. You want, do you want it? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Commissioner Christine Savinica. Thank you.